Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Anna Kreit and I'm the host for today's talk. If you're participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation. And we'll have some time to address these questions after the presentation is complete. Today's speaker is Dr. Helen Ethan. Helen is a member of the Uganda Tanzania branch of the SIL International. She has extensive experience researching the Sandawi language of Tanzania, as well as a number of Bantu languages spoken near Mbeya in southern Tanzania. Uh, this research is part of a career that spans over the past two decades. Helen has produced a number of publications based on this research, with a strong focus on the domains of information structure and narrative discourse. She has also published A Grammar of Sandawi in 2010. So please join me in welcoming Helen today for her presentation, which is titled A Formal Typology of Class Linkage in Sundawe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation and thank you if you're listening in now or later. What I'd like to present to you today is um, based on a working paper that's published by SIL International last year. It's available for free online. Um, it's the beginnings of uh, a formal typology of clause linkage in Sandawe. And my starting point for this topic was that Sandawe has an atypical system of marking the subject and term of a clause. So this makes categorizing the clauses according to traditional distinctions between coordination and subordination quite a challenge. Of course, Sandawe is not the only language that challenges um, the traditional distinction in this way. So there have been several attempts to define subordination in clause linkage more rigorously in order for it to be consistently applicable cross-linguistically. So today I'd like to firstly very briefly review those typological approaches to clause linkage and then illustrate the basics of the clause in Sandawe. And then I'll spend most of my time presenting um, a suggestion for a formal typology of clause linkage in Sandawe. So firstly, very briefly, the history of clause typology. Uh, Gast and Diesel recognized three major factors in the traditional analysis of clause combining. So first we have the relation of dependency holding between the clause and the attachment site. Then we have the properties of the attachment site. And thirdly, the properties of the attached clause. And the first of these factors concerns this contrast between coordination and subordination. And dependency could be interpreted in different ways, of course. So we could have a syntactically independent clause um, that stands by itself. Um, a clause could be semantically independent if it can be fully interpreted by itself. And it could be prosodically independent if it forms an international phrase by itself. Dixon um, divides the ways in which clauses can form complex sentences into three basic syntactic types. So he has um, coordinate and non-embedded subordinate constructions and then relative clauses and then complement clauses. So in his system, type one includes a range of constructions, both coordinate and subordinate, whereas types two and three are both embedded subordinate constructions. So this approach separates the clearly dependent constructions, type two and three, from those where the issue of dependency is more complex. And then we have the parametric approaches to dependency and subordination. So these provide a way to view the distinction between coordination and subordination as a gradual one, and they better capture the complexity of the phenomena across different languages. So we've got Hyman and Thompson from 1984, they propose seven independent formal properties which are relevant in judging whether a clause is subordinate or not. So there's the identity between the two clauses of subject, tense or mood, reduction of one of the clauses, grammatically signaled incorporation of one of the clauses, international linking between the two clauses, the question of whether one clause is, is, is within the scope of the other, an absence of tense iconicity between the two clauses and identity between the two clauses of speech act perspective. And a similar composite approach is put forward um, by Lehman in 1988. And he proposes three dimensions along 
which linked clauses may differ and each dimension has within it a pair of sub parameters so the first dimension is autonomy versus integration and within this we have the sub parameters of the hierarchical downgrading of the subordinate clause the main clause syntactic level of the subordinate clause then we have expansion versus reduction which is the desententialization of the subordinate clause and the grammaticalization of the main verb and isolation versus linkage the interlacing of the two clauses and the explicitness of the linking so i've gone through quite fast without giving much explanation but i'll be referring back to some of these approaches and parameters when we look at the sandawe data but there is more on these approaches in the working paper if you're interested so the data I have mainly comes from a corpus of narrative texts, 46 narrative texts. And to give you a little bit of background first about Sandawe, um, one thing to note is that unmarked constituent order for the clause in Sandawe is SOV, but all other permutations of these three constituents are possible given appropriate discourse conditions. And this constituent order flexibility means that the subject is usually identified through morphology. And the morphemes which function as identifiers of the subject are multi-purpose. They also mark the mood and polarity properties of the clause. So for affirmative realis clauses, the relevant subject marking morphemes are the realis pronominal clitic, which I abbreviate to RPC, and the subject focus marker, abbreviated to SF. So the RPC indicates the person, gender, and number of the clausal subject. And it may be attached to one or more non-subject clause constituents, whereas the SF marker is attached to the subject itself. So before we look at examples of clause linkage, let's just see how these morphemes are used in simple sentences. So in one, Ursa Menazzi, she is or was very happy. Um, we have an adverb that is uh, that contains the RPC, the realis pronominal clitic. And in two, tame chun swa me nazi, the woman is or was happy. Then we have um, the subject focus marker on the subject, the woman. Another option we could have um, in three, the subject has the subject focus marker and there is an adverb with an RPC. So we've got two subject marking morphemes in the same clause. And in four, just to show that the RPC can actually um, turn up on the verb. Uh, we've got an example where there's a subject and a verb and the RPC is on the verb. The choice of which of these morphemes to employ and in which position, as well as the choice of constituent order depends largely on the information structure of the clause. So just as an example in four, uh, where the RPC is on the verb, there is um, polarity focus. So in some contexts where you are not expecting the woman to be happy, if you want to state that the woman is happy or was happy, then tame chuns menatsisa is the way to do that by putting the RPC on the verb. So combinations of RPC and SF placement other than those shown um, here are possible. Um, there are a lot of um, possibilities depending on the constituent order of the clause and the restrictions which are placed on this variation concern the position of the verb in relation to the other clause constituents. So namely the first is that a verb which does not carry a realis pronominal clitic must not precede the first RPC or SF marker of a clause, i.e. the first subject marking morpheme of a clause. And then a verb which does carry the clitic must not be preceded by a constituent bearing one of the subject marking morphemes. So these restrictions are um, particularly helpful if we're looking at the issue of where clause boundaries might be in complex sentences, as we'll see. And as a contrast to these realis sentences, in irrealis clauses, subject marking is always and only on the verb. So it looks slightly more traditional. Um, it looks more like example four um, went with the irrealis morphemes. So the data corpus that I have provides examples of complex sentences which can be grouped into the following nine types according to how the clauses are linked. So we have conjunctions which are marked in agreement with the clausal subject, 
the narrative connective clitic a, uh, the connective ning, which can also be reduced just to uh, high tone and um, nasalization. The freestanding conjunctions, which are not marked in agreement with the clause or subject. The uh, temporal subordinate clause construction, which has a he um, at the beginning of the clause and an e at the end of the clause. The locative si, non embedded subordinate uh, constructions marked by nominalizers, complement clauses, and relative clauses. Now, it's obviously not possible to consider all these types in um, a relatively short presentation. So I'm going to restrict my comments to the first three types. And these are the ones that I think are particularly typologically interesting. So let's start with the first type, which is conjunctions which are marked in agreement with the clausal subject. So Sandawi clauses can be combined by means of freestanding conjunctions, which agree with the subject of the clause. There are three sets as shown here, narrative, glossed NC, repetitive, glossed RC, and subjunctive, glossed SC. So example five here gives um, two instances of the narrative conjunction. So we have a newayo sa umunswa kabiso sa owe. Then they lived for a while and the wife became pregnant. So in the first clause, the third person plural narrative conjunction a is sentence initial and it's the only means of identifying the subject in this clause. And then in the second clause, we've got the third person feminine singular narrative conjunction sa, which has the dual function of signaling the switch in subject and linking this clause to the previous one. So in a sense, it's and then she um, in terms of its meaning. In the second clause, the subject is also indicated by the realis pronominal clitic on the object, Gabiso, stomach. So, and also by the subject focus marker on the subject itself, on the word for wife. So in neither clause um, does the verb carry the realis pronominal clitic and actually for it do, to do so would render the clauses ungrammatical. So as I said before, a verb which does not carry a, an RPC must be preceded by a constituent bearing one of the subject markers within the clause. And in the second clause, this rule is clearly followed as we've got an unmarked verb preceded by both an SF marker and an RPC. But as the first clause contains only the conjunction and the unmarked verb, it follows that the conjunction must be marked with the RPC, even though this isn't immediately apparent in the surface form. But it's been argued by Elderkin that there is um, the clitic within this uh, conjunction. Repetitive clitics uh, relate to clause structure and subject marking in the same way as the narrative conjunctions, but they show that the situation described by the clause is either being repeated on a specific occasion or it's happening habitually. The subjunctive uh, conjunctions are slightly different. Typically, they're found at the beginning of subjunctive clauses, often following a clause containing a subjunctive pronominal clitic. So here we've got Akiko or ni, get down and let's go. So the first clause contains the subjunctive pronominal clitic, and the second clause um, has the conjunction, the subjunctive conjunction. So when a clause containing a narrative clitic or a subjunctive clitic has an irrealist verb, we have a, a slightly different meaning. So the construction as a whole conveys a purposive meaning. So as in the second clause here of seven. So, tiki ti msa hakas ba tri. And I will call my person so that he can come. So, ba tri, instead of meaning and then he came, because it's marked as an irrealist clause, its uh, meaning is so that he can come. So, these examples uh, containing narrative and subjunctive conjunctions, they differ with respect to modality and actual function, but they share the properties that are relevant to the question of the coordination versus um, subordination question. So if we consider the parameters suggested by Hyman and Thompson and Lehman, both approaches place these clauses in Sundawe, um, the ones linked by subject mark conjunctions, very much at the coordination end of the continuum. So if Hyman and Thompson's seven properties of um, main subordinate clause combinations, only one 
um, is attested in the Sandawi examples, that of international linking between the clauses. And if we apply Lehman six parameters, we see that Sandawi clauses involve no hierarchical downgrading. They're integrated at the text level as independent clauses, and this locates them at the autonomy end of the autonomy versus integration dimension. And with respect to expansion versus reduction, there's no desententialization associated with subordinate clauses. There's no grammaticalization of the main verb associated with main clauses. And in terms of isolation versus linkage, the two clauses in Sandawe may be interlaced by identity of subject or modality, but they need not be, as we've seen. And they are explicitly linked through the presence of the conjunction as well as through intonation. So very much at the coordination end of uh, the spectrum. But there's one special case of using subject mark con conjunctions to link Sandawe clauses, which merits a closer look. In this case, the conjunction occurs clause finally, and this arrangement of clauses then partly deviates from the properties I've just noticed. So we've got two examples here, one, the first with a narrative conjunction and the second with a subjunctive conjunction, um, in both cases at the end. So the first is, One day we went hunting pigs, first clause, because they had eaten another friend's field. And doloko inke keeso go, choose slowly, otherwise they will hear. So in this use where um, we have the conjunction at the end of the clause, in fact, the end of the sentence in both cases, when it is a narrative conjunction, it expresses a causal relationship because, and when it's the subjunctive conjunction, it's a relationship of possible consequence otherwise. And what's remarkable about use, both uses is that the subject marking of the conjunction, which comes at the end of the second clause, is in agreement with the subject of the first clause rather with, than with that of the second. So if you look at the first example, in our two clauses, we have two different subjects. So it's first person plural for the first clause and the second because they, the pigs, had eaten is third person plural. But the conjunction at the end of the second clause is a first person plural one. So it's marked in agreement with the first clause and it's showing the linkage between the two, uh, the causal link between the two. And the same in the second. So um, choose slowly is second person singular. They will hear is third person plural. But again, there's a second person singular marked subjunctive conjunction at the end. Um, to, to show the link with the first clause. And in both cases, the second clause would be a well-formed independent clause if the conjunction were omitted. But the presence of the conjunction necessitates a preceding clause with a subject with appropriate uh, agreement properties. So this special use of subject marked conjunctions in Sandawe is something that takes this construction slightly further away from coordination and towards subordination because it's an instance of Hyman and Thompson's third property of subordinate clauses, that of grammatically signaled incorporation. So they define this property as incorporation of one clause within another where this incorporation is signaled by material of one clause surrounding another or by grammatical morphology marking one clause as being a grammatical part of another. So in both senses of that definition, um, we have this grammatically signaled incorporation here. And in terms of layman's approach, the second clause in the Sandawi examples is hierarchically downgraded to the status of an adjoined clause, which is integrated at the sentence level rather than the text level. So let's move on to the second clause linkage strategy in Sandawi that I'd like to consider. This is the narrative connective clitic R Gloucester's con. And this morpheme attaches to a verb and joins two clauses with the same subject, which is um, a difference from what we've seen in the first uh, category. So, sa mea mancha kuin hesu no kong sosa. She entered and fed her children. So, the narrative connective here is connecting she entered with fed her children. And the narrative connective is interesting. Uh, it's restricted in its use 
to realis clauses containing a subject mark conjunction, like the narrative conjunction or the repetitive conjunction. So the sa here at the beginning is allowing the use of the narrative connective. And the clause containing the narrative connective and the clause which follows it are not of equal syntactic status in terms of dependency if we look carefully at their properties. So the clause containing the narrative connective must be well formed in terms of the distribution of its subject marking morphemes, the realis pronominal clitics and the subject focus markers. But the following clause need not be. So here in 10, the first clause is a well-formed simple sentence if we remove the narrative connective. But without the narrative connective in the first clause, the second clause would be problematic. It would violate the distribution rules for subject marking morphemes. The verb in the second clause doesn't carry um, a realis pronominal clitic and it precedes an object which does. So this would not be allowed in a standalone clause. So we've got the structure in 10 of a narrative conjunction followed by a verb with a connective, a verb with no subject marking, an object with the realis pronominal clitic, and this is fine. But if we took away the first clause, the second clause order and subject marking morpheme distribution would not be allowed. And this is also clear from examples where the second clause is a single verb. So in something like 11, then he did again and made it for him. Um, in the second clause, we've just got um, a single verb with no subject marking morpheme. It has objects marked in it, but no subject. So thus for the purposes of applying the subject marking rules, the second clause is counted together with the first clause. Subject marking morphemes in the first effect, what is grammatical in the second. And a less literal uh, translation of 11 would be, then he made it for him again. So in formal terms, we have two verbs um, connected by the narrative connective, which is the same formally as the example, she entered and fed her children of 10. But semantically, it's quite different here. And it shows parallels with um, serial verb constructions. So the, in, in a serial verb construction, the verbs in the construction all refer to subparts or aspects of a single overall event, which is what's going on here with this example. But um, there are some reasons why we wouldn't call it a serial verb construction formally, even though semantically it, it has um, parallels with one. In formal terms, the narrative connective construction doesn't resemble the prototypical serial verb construction as it includes an explicit connective in the form of the a, and it's also not monoclausal construction and there's no restriction on other constituents intervening between the verbs so it doesn't really follow that it's a serial verb construction but it can certainly be used for very similar functions although it can also be used for sequential events um, as we saw in the previous example so in terms of the formal properties of hyman and thompson this construction is further along the continuum towards subordination in comparison with clauses joined by the narrative conjunction alone. So of course in these there are narrative conjunctions but not just narrative conjunctions. Um, the one reason it's further along the continuum is that there must be identity of subject and modality between the two clauses and another reason is that the second clause may be reduced and would not be able to stand alone without the previous clause. And with respect to the autonomy versus integration dimension of Lehman, Clauses joined by the narrative connective do not show hierarchical downgrading, but the joining takes place at a lower syntactic level, as evidenced by the requirement that they share a subject, and by the way in which the subject marking rules extend across both clauses. So in comparison with clauses uh, joined by a narrative conjunction, they are at a lower, the joining is at a lower syntactic level. The data corpus also shows that the narrative connective uh, typically attaches to the first of two linked verbs, but it is possible for it to attach to the second instead. So here we have sue ba, be ba, matza, dara iea, heso ion sutza. Now he hid himself nearby and stayed waiting for their mother. And there's two narrative connective morphemes in this sentence. The first is in the typical position at the end of the first clause. So it links um, to what follows. 
but the second morpheme is on the third rather than the second of the sentence's three verbs, and it links it to the preceding verb. So this unusual order in the second clause of V1, then V2, and then the narrative connective has a particular meaning in Sandari. It, it expresses the simultaneity of the situations conveyed by the verbs. In contrast with the more normal order, where we have um, the first verb, then the connective, then the second verb. And here we've got sequ sequentiality. So the uh, second clause has wait, stay, and, which really means stay waiting. Whereas in the first use of the connective in the sentence, we've got hide and wait, which happen sequentially. So when we have the V1, V2 connective construction, um, being used with a verb like stay, the resulting verb conjunction conveys progressive aspect. So like example 11, it's functioning quite similar way to a serial verb construction, even though formally it's quite different. And this order of V1, V2, and then the connective shows an absence of tense iconicity, which is something that Hyman and Thompson include in uh, one of, as one of their composite factors in subordination. So the order of the clauses do not, does not correspond, or the order of the verbs does not correspond to the order of events. In contrast, the more common order does, the hiding happened first and then the waiting. The narrative connective only occurs in realis clauses containing a subject mark conjunction. So in other clause types, there's a need for a different kind of connective, and this is the connective ning, which is a freestanding conjunction or could be reduced to a floating high tone and nasalization on the word final vowel of the verb to which it's attached. It's glossed by an ampersand in my examples when it occurs in this way. So in 13, for example, uh, means I found meat on the path and ate it. There's no subject marked con conjunction in the first clause. So this means you can't use the narrative connective to link A and B. And instead, the conjunction ning is employed to link these two uh, clauses. It's quite common to see this conjunction in its reduced form, more common, in fact, than in its unreduced form. So here we've got do it again and make it for me. So this example is very similar to what we saw in example 11. Um, which I'm repeating here, the same two verbs being joined by the narrative connective morpheme are. And as with that example, a more natural uh, translation would be using uh, an adverb, make it again for me. The two verbs are referring to the same overall event, but it happens to be the way that Sandawe expresses again is with a verb that means do again rather than an adverb. And it's very common for verbs joined by the connected ning or its reduced form to convey semantic components of a single event in this way. Often one of the verbs contributes an aspectual meaning. So in example 15, klemse means finish. So ta fan klemse, literally um, she runs and finishes. Uh, we've got perfective aspect. And then in 16, ir san ta, she stays or she stayed and ran and runs. Um, we've got imperfective aspects. So the semantic reduction here of stay is quite clear. It no longer conveys the meaning of remaining in a particular place when it's linked to ta, to run. Um, but in formal terms, there's no grammatical asymmetry between the verb functioning as an auxiliary and the verb providing the lexical content. The formal properties of the construction depend on which verb bears the connective morpheme rather than on the nature of the semantic content contributed by the verbs. In formal terms, the, the narrative connective R and the connective morpheme mean cover the same range of uses. The important, difference, the important differences are that the distribution of the former is restricted to certain clause types and that the latter is more commonly used to join verbs which express different semantic components of a single event rather than um, different events, although it's still possible to do that, as we saw in one of the examples. In formal terms, the two clause linkage strategies are also very similar. 
for example, one of the link clauses may be dependent on the other for its subject and modality marking. And there's a like, lack of tense iconicity between the clauses when the connective morpheme attaches to the second rather than the first verb. So that's another similarity. An important formal difference between the narrative connective and the freestanding conjunction ning is that the latter doesn't require the clauses which it links to have the same subject, whereas the former does. So in terms of the autonomy versus integration dimension of Lehman, a case can be made for clause conjunction using ning to be occurring at a higher syntactic level than clause conjunction through the narrative connective a. So in this sense, this one is slightly more towards coordination um, than the previous category we looked at. But then the way in which um, the connective ning is used to join verbs perhaps resembles a serial construction, serial verb construction more closely than the use of the narrative connective a does because it's reduced to a non-segmental form most of the time to floating nasalization and high tone. So it seems to be further along a grammaticalization path towards official categorization as a sub, uh, serial verb construction. The distribution rules for subject marking morphemes apply to constructions um, which are joined in this way by Ning, but with the exception that both verbs can be marked with a realis pronominal clitic as long as it's the second which carries the connective morpheme. So if we look at this example, which is not allowed, this is what we would expect, um, it mirrors what we've seen in relation to the narrative connective. So what follows a connective morpheme need not be uh, well formed in isolation in terms of subject marking. It's counted together with the same clause. So ta san yesa is not possible, we assume, because the second word is a verb and there's already uh, an RPC before it. But then uh, that's what we would expect. But then with 18, we see something different. So it suggests there's a clause boundary between the two verbs when the connective morpheme as it is on the second verb. So ta sa ye san is allowed. So the first verb plus the RPC um, is a complete well-formed clause and it's not immediately followed by any form of connective. The second clause is the one um, that has the uh, connective morpheme on it. So there's um, asymmetry here, which is quite interesting. It's also interesting to note that you can't have a verb joined to another verb um, with the connective morpheme in between and then the RPC. So this tang yesa would not be possible. So you can't create a, a compound uh, verb form and then treat it as a single constituent for subject marking purposes, at least not in the realis clauses, because irrealis clauses work differently. As I said, you can only uh, find you can only put the subject and modality marking on the verb. So when you join two or more verbs together with um, the connective, it's the last verb which carries the inflection morpheme. So he so gisos iso sonso guameng habatseng atiso. These two would come driving out and making noise. So the so, the um, irrealis uh, third person plural morpheme is on the final verb, and there are two examples of. Um, the connective at the end of guameng and habatseng. An example like this bears some resemblance to clause chaining because it's the last verb in a chain of clauses that's inflected, but there's no special converb suffix on the preceding verbs to show they're part of the chain unless we count the connective morpheme as that kind of suffix. But the connective morpheme used here is the same as that used to join other constituents, even NPs. So it's not a special verb suffix here. So in summary, we've looked at three types of clause linkage in Sundawe out of the nine I mentioned. Um, these three conjunctions marked in agreement with the subject. Uh, the second, the narrative connective R, and these clauses will always have the, the first type of conjunction as well. And then a different kind of connective, which is not restricted to clauses with conjunctions. And a very uh, rough summary would be that the first type is closer to the coordination end of the subordination coordination spectrum. And the second and third are closer to the subordination end, but not exactly as simply as the, the picture suggests. 
And I think that the feature-based or parametric typological approaches I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation help us to characterize more precisely where these clause linkage strategies fall on the spectrum. By looking um, separately at features such as grammatically signaled incorporation, identity of subject and modality, and tense iconicity. So if you're interested in this topic, please have a look at the paper that I mentioned at the start if you'd uh, like to know more. Thank you very much for listening. Okay, Helen, thank you very much for this really interesting presentation. I'm now going to open the floor for any questions or comments, so please write them in the chat module. Uh, and uh, I will read them out so Helen can address them. Uh, to give everyone some time to write their questions, I'm going to start with one of my own. Um, and it's really quite simple. I'm, I'm really interested to see what kind of corpus you have and what your data is based on. Okay, yeah, it's um, a corpus of 46 uh, narrative texts. And there is a mixture in there of um, texts which were uh, oral texts which were transcribed and uh, texts which were written down by the authors who were um, learning the orthography. So it's a mixture of both texts, but um, I only looked at narrative texts for the purposes of um, this part of the research, but um, some of the narrative texts have uh, obviously have uh, speech. So there's some interesting examples which are not um, part of the, the narration as such, um, but they're what characters are saying, so it's not as restricted as it may sound, saying that it's narrative texts. Okay, thank you. Um, and I have a question from Marte. He asks if you have any um, classes linked just by juxtaposition in narratives. Um, very, very rarely. Um, that is really the tenth <laughs> type, which I didn't mention. Um, I found them and I, I have a feeling that it's, um, it may be more of an oral feature than a written feature, but I would have to look very carefully at that. It's certainly very rare though, because certainly in narratives, the uh, narrative conjunctions are extremely frequent um, in, in most clauses. It is basically the default. So when you're, if you're thinking of um, Swahili, when a, a Sandawi speaker is asked to give a gloss for um, a sentence or a, a, some clauses containing the narrative conjunction, they, they won't use halafu, they won't use a, a conjunction in Swahili for their ba or sa for their conjunctions in Sandawi. They would just use the ka tense form in Swahili um, because it's, it's the unmarked way of uh, narrating clauses. I'm gonna go to Richard first. Um, so Richard says, thank you for your talk. And he asks if you see any similarities with Khoisan languages of Southern Africa in terms of these clause linking constructions. And also, do you see anything similar in the area surrounding Sandawi? Um, that's a really good question. I have no idea for the first uh, question. I would be very interested to know. Um, there, there's been some comparison of Khoisan languages of Southern Africa in terms of the subject marking morphemes. So uh, if you look at Elderkin's work in particular, um, there's a lot on that. So there's similarities there, but in terms of the conjunction and the clause linking constructions, I'm not aware um, of where there would be similarities. And it's a very interesting question. Are there similarities um, in the surrounding area? And I think I should be asking the question back to anybody who's listening, really, because I don't know the other languages in the area. But I'm, I'd be really interested if someone is going to give a talk on clause linkage in any of the surrounding languages, because um, to me, some of the things that Sandawi does are just very unusual. And I would love to know if other languages were doing something similar. And Martin has another question. Uh, he asks, when authors start to write in your corpus, do you see more complex class linkages? Um, that's an, another really good question. I'm trying to remember because it's been a while since I collected the data. Um, what I do remember is some of the examples of um, the, the what I think is particularly interesting is when you get the conjunction at the, at the very end of a sentence and it has this causal or um, other kind of meaning, the otherwise meaning, um, that those were in oral texts, 
so that was quite interesting to me but um, this was not something that came out when people were were um, struggling to write uh, and but it was something they did naturally um, yeah so that I, I the hunting story one that was an uh, an oral story um, later written down um, what I did find I do remember finding that we also have been working in translation and there were some of the types that I, I didn't actually talk about. We really only found in translation, which concerned me because it seemed like um, we were forcing people to do something unnaturally. So um, one of the types I mentioned but didn't talk about um, was, uh, how did I describe it? So non-embedded subordinate constructions marked by nominalizers. I really felt like that was only coming up in translation. So that was quite interesting to me. Um, yeah. He follows it up by asking if there's any parallel in Sandawi of similar structures with this clause, final sentence, final connector. I'm not sure I understand. Is there any parallel in Sandawi of similar structures with this clause, final sentence, final? Um, I'm not sure what's being asked. I mean, this is, to me, I find it strange as well, that this whole um, construction um, with the clause final connector, because that is just not what you're expecting, obviously, for anything that's doing uh, clause final, other clause final functional elements. Not that I'm aware of. No, um, this is the only example of this kind of thing that I've come across. Okay, then we have one more question from Andrew. He asks, uh, oh, it's more of a comment actually. Um, he says the knee class connector is striking to me that the relative class marker in the Bantu languages, Ihansu, Nilamba, and Nyaturu is knee. Um, for example, a nasal and high vowel uh, followed by a floating high tone. Obviously, it's hard to say if the two have the same origin. Uh, an alveolar nasal and the plus a high tone is in prayer, and from the uh, and the Bantu forms may have come from a copular form. Uh, it would be interesting to see if there's any knee or knee like forms in wider Khoisan. Yes, I can just agree on that. Definitely, it would be. Um, yeah. Okay, then if there's no more questions, um, then if not, I'd like to thank you again, Helen, for this really interesting talk. And everyone who participated with uh, the live webinar and for all the questions and comments. Um, I also like to take this opportunity to um, remind everyone that the recordings of all the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Um, this was the last presentation of 2019. Uh, they're going to start up again with a new webinar series in 2020. Um, these are going to be um, announced through the emailing list. So. Then I would just like to say thanks again to everyone participating and hopefully seeing you at the next webinar.